Good morning, everyone. How are you? Good. <clears throat> um, I hope you had as much fun last night as, as, uh, as we did. Uh, it, was, oh, it was really fun. And uh, <clears throat> so today is where, is, last night was all the fun, today's all the work. <laughs> no, it's going to be fun too. Um, what we're trying to do at the summit, and you know, this is, um, when we try to bring you all together, of course, it costs you a lot of money to do this and a lot of time, and there's a carbon footprint. Uh, and, uh, and of course, it takes a lot of work for us to put these things together, too. So what we want this to be is a very productive day in terms of uh, you being able to help each other and help us shape the initiative so that when you, can, when you go back to your campuses, you're able to take back some ideas and also to help us to help you because we're all in this together to try to figure out how we can transform our institutions for the purpose of, of making sure that we can be a demonstration site for sustainable living and also to be able to educate our students in a way that will be beneficial to them uh, for them and for future generations. So the design of the whole meeting today is all about participation by you and, and generating ideas. Uh, and also, I think that you can contribute uh, to helping not only yourselves, but to helping other institutions in your region or like institutions, and also contributing to the national initiative so that we can move the entire agenda forward. So we, uh, uh, we're, we're not gonna have many presentations today, and it's mostly going to be interactive discussions, which uh, Mitch Tomashaw will explain a little bit later. But this morning, we want to start off with a, a really special, uh, a special piece. Um, you know, one of the things that you have said over and over again, and we believe very strongly, is that the relationship between the colleges and the local communities or the regions in which they live is extremely important. And it's becoming more and more important because higher, uh, the higher education institutions are the anchor institutions for economic development. You know, the idea that it's a GE would come in and be the major employer for the next 50 years is a thing of the past in the private sector. And the, um, but the institutions that we want to stay around for a long time are the colleges and universities. And we know that the skill level that everybody needs and ongoing throughout their lives has continued to rise. So the, the connection between the colleges and universities and the local communities is extremely important. And we're going to have uh, three examples of that today. And the first one we're going to start with is a very, uh, uh, very innovative project in, at, uh, that Oberlin College is doing with the city of Oberlin and the greater uh, Oberlin area. And I'm uh, delighted to uh, be able to introduce uh, two people that will be uh, really leading us through this discussion, uh, Marvin Krisloff, who's uh, president of Oberlin College, and David Orr, who I think needs no introduction to most of you as a, uh, an environmental leader and educator and author. Uh, and it was, it's with uh, great pleasure that I uh, introduce them both so that you can get a sense of this exciting project that's going on in Oberlin. And thank you, Marvin, for your leadership uh, and, uh, of course, uh, David, for yours as well. Marvin? Thank you, Tony. It's really an honor to be here today representing Oberlin College and all the citizens of Oberlin. We're very proud to have been one of the first signatories of the American College and University President's Climate Commitment. Nancy Dye, my predecessor as president, and our board of trustees led in that initiative, we continue to address climate change in our campus and our town. Now, there's several reasons why Oberlin College is addressing climate change. First and foremost, it fits with our educational mission, our values, and our history of positive social action. Oberlin is a small town. We have over 8,000 residents. But our folks have had a large effect on the course of history. To give a couple of quick examples, we were the first institution of higher education to admit a policy of admitting people regardless of color, and we were also the first to award bachelor's degrees to women in a baccalaureate program. Given our, co our college's history, it should be no surprise that we believe colleges and universities can lead the way on climate issues. 
for the vast majority of our students, faculty, and staff combating climate change and more broadly um, promoting sustainability is the greatest challenge of our time. Our climate and sustainability initiatives have benefited our college, our community, and the world in a number of ways. On our campus, they connect with today's students by giving them an educational environment in which to test their ideas and to collaborate with faculty on research. These initiatives have also resulted in new green businesses in Oberlin and in other parts of the country by being established by Oberlin Environmental Studies graduates. These include a resource monitoring system, a biofuels fuels company, ecological design firm, the East College Street Project, which is a mixed-use green project on the corner of town, and sustainable urban agriculture. We believe institutions of higher education are uniquely positioned to collaborate with local, regional, and national partners to drive sustainable economic development in college communities, big or small. That is the goal of our pioneering Oberlin project. The project is a bold vision for transforming our small Rust Belt town and our region into a global model of holistic, carbon neutral economic development based on higher education and the arts. That vision is becoming reality, but it is a huge undertaking. We are working with the Clinton Climate Initiative and collaborating with the city of Oberlin and regional partners in Northeast Ohio to make this happen. Collaborating with so many partners is very difficult. There are many committees that meet. I'm sure all of you are familiar with committees. But these are committees that involve people from the community, people from the region, as well as members of our college campus. The communities include land and local foods, energy, education, economic development, transportation, just to name a few. But we are finding common ground and making progress. As part of the Oberlin Project, we are also working with private and public partners to create a 13-acre green arts district in the middle of downtown Oberlin. In everything we're doing, our overarching goal is to become carbon neutral and sustainable. Since we became part of the ACUPCC in the fall of 2006, we have taken numerous steps toward the goal of becoming carbon neutral. Over the past few years, we've demonstrated our determination to lead by working to provide cleaner energy and by applying sustainable principles to our construction and renovation projects. As we meet today, for instance, a 2.27 megawatt solar array is being constructed by a private sector partner on 10 acres of Oberlin College property. It will be the largest photovoltaic array on any college or university campus in Ohio. We expect it to be completed by the end of this August. It will generate approximately 3 million kilowatt hours of electricity, electricity per year. This is enough to power 400 to 450 homes and is equal to 12% of the college's annual consumption. The purchase of electricity from this system will move the college significantly closer toward our goal of carbon neutrality. Since 2006, every major, every major construction or renovation project at Oberlin has achieved LEED Gold Standard. These projects include the creation of the Conservatory of Music's Jazz Building and the renovation of our historic Allen Memorial Art Museum. Our commitment to carbon neutrality has also in, helped inspire Professor David Orr and others to conceive of the Oberlin Project. This is a joint effort by the college, the city, and the schools and other re local and regional partners to transform our community into a model of sustainable, carbon neutral economic development centered on education and the arts. We are seeking a holistic way of living in the future. This approach, based on sound ecological design, is not specific to our campus or town, but is replicable elsewhere. To that end, we joined the Climate Positive Development Program in 2010. This is a joint initiative of the Clinton Climate Initiative, a program of the William J. Clinton Foundation and the U.S. Green Building Council. The program supports the development of large-scale urban projects that demonstrate that cities can grow in ways that are climate positive, also able to reduce the amount of on-site CO2 emissions to below zero. Many, many people, students, faculty, staff, alumni, as well as foundations, NGOs, local, state, and national governments, and civic leaders and private individuals have supported our efforts to become carbon neutral. But one man has played the leading role in fighting climate change and promoting a carbon neutral, 
socially just, and economically prosperous society, not only in Oberlin, but around the world. Although David Orr often sports a Red Sox cap, he actually wears many caps. He is our Paul Sears Professor of Environmental Studies and Special Assistant to the President on Sustainability. He also serves as Executive Director of the Oberlin Project. He is the recipient of numerous honorary degrees and awards. He is a scholar, a teacher, entrepreneur, and a prolific author. His latest book is Hope is an Imperative, The Essential David Orr, a collection of his writings from 1985 to 2010. David was the driving force behind our effort to design and build the Adam Joseph Lewis Center, the first substantially green building on a U.S. college campus. The Lewis Center was name, na later named by the U.S. Department of Energy as one of 30 milestone buildings in the 20th century, and by the New York Times as the most interesting of a new generation of college and university buildings. More importantly, it has become a laboratory in sustainability that is training some of our nation's brightest and most dedicated students and faculty in, in solving environmental problems. For David, solving these problems isn't just a job, it isn't just a career, it's his calling. Through his work and his deeds, David Orr inspires our hopes and invigorates our efforts to create a better future for our planet. I can think of no person who more deserves the term visionary than him. Please join me in welcoming David Orr. Good morning, everybody. Marvin, thank you for the, uh, th those remarks. Uh, I've got a confession to make. I was part of the rowdy table last night. If you heard all the racket at the back, that was us. Uh, it started when the waiter uh, poured a glass of wine on my pants. <laughs> and then Cindy Thomas show, sitting over here to my left, all of you know Cindy, uh, then poured a bottle of salsa water on my pants. <laughs> And then the worst part of it was when the waiter charged me for the wine, he said, if you leave with wine in you or on you, you're, you're billed for it. <laughs> Cindy charged me for the salsa water, and it went downhill from, uh, from there. Um, uh, it wasn't just Cindy, though. It was Mitch and Tom and Peter and Steve and even Marvin weighed in at the end, and we were the, we were the racket at the back. Uh, a couple of thank yous around this room, and I want to start with uh, my friend Tony uh, Cortese. And I've known Tony uh, since, oh, 1923. Uh, uh, Tony was the driver uh, in making Second Nature what it has become, and he's the reason we're all here uh, today. So on this issue, uh, Tony has been the catalyst around which, uh, or <laughs> the pearl, he's the irritant in the shell that has... <laughs> as you heard last night, that has brought all of us together. And the pearl that has grown out of this is, is this climate commitment, which is, is growing. Uh, second, I want to thank all of you. And Diane Dillon Ridgely last night referred to all of us as a family. And I think that uh, that's a very apt way to describe what's emerged on college campuses around the country. This is kind of a family gathering, uh, certainly united by common purpose and a common vision of a carbon uh, neutral world. Uh, there are lots of other thank yous, and not, not the least to uh, Marvin Krizloff, who is uh, the 14th president of Oberlin College and, and has been in his five years an extraordinary leader. My dad was a college president, so I, my standards for your profession are kind of high, uh, and he ranks at the top. So it's a pleasure to work with Marvin and for Marvin and, and on a campus that has had long commitments to uh, things environmental and human betterment. Uh, let me add a few words about the, the Oberlin Project. Uh, th this began in long discussions that have gone back maybe uh, four or five years of what do we do. And as a personal story here, in 2008, uh, climate became much more of a, an issue for me as it did for all of you. And uh, as the scientific evidence began to come in, and we saw this being an issue that was far worse than anything we thought it had been, let's say, in 1990 or 95 or even 2000, uh, the question comes, came back is, what do we do about this? And all of you are in that question and trying to find an answer for that. For me, I happen to be living in, in um, London as part of our 
uh, London program in the spring of 2008, and I sat down and wrote a book called Down to the Wire. And for me, that was a 35,000-foot meditation on what it means for us to live in this particular era and understand what this thing is all about. This isn't, uh, it, it isn't quite a solvable problem in the way we think of solving problems. Once we've changed atmospheric chemistry, as we have, carbon stays in the atmosphere for a long time. So Susan Solomon, in her uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science paper in uh, 2009, said if we stop emitting carbon right today, totally, and all of the heat trapping gases, temperature of the planet will continue to rise for another thousand years. Sea levels will continue to rise with all that pertains there unto. We're now locked into something that to the International Energy Agency looks like almost for certain a two degree centigrade warming uh, sometime well before mid-century. Remember back uh, not too far, not too long ago, two degree centigrade warming was something that was talked about at the year maybe 2100. Now it's coming much faster, much bigger, and we know now that it's permanent. Carbon stays in the atmosphere for a long time. Whether it's 1,000 years or 5,000 years or 500 years, doesn't matter. By the way we measure time, that, that is the ballgame. Uh, the Royal Academy of Sciences, before the Cancun meeting, uh, put out a report that said within the error bars of what we know, a four degree centigrade warming is plausible by the year 2061. We wouldn't survive that. Now, the point of this isn't to engage in doom and gloom. It's to put the cards on the table. And we, we face a communication issue. And all of you deal, all of us deal with young people. How do we say this to young people? Uh, we're called to uh, be truthful. That's the task of a teacher. To be truthful about the future is we've compromised already a good bit of the human future. And that's not fixable. That's already, we bought that. There's no known way to get carbon back out of the atmosphere at a price we could afford, at a time scale that's relevant, uh, we, we don't know how to do that. So now we've got to face, uh, what do we tell our, our kids? Uh, the Open Project is born uh, out of that sense of realism, of what do we do? And once we've, uh, once uh, young people, as they do, understand the issues of climate change, how then do we take their energy? We've raised the anxiety level. How do we redirect that? In large part, uh, the work we did on the Lewis Center and lots of uh, your campuses and your work uh, that we built on uh, and the Oberlin Project are an answer to that question. What do we then do? And how do we equip them to live in what is now uh, called by the New York Times the Anthropocene? Just a fancy word to say that we're now in the driver's seat. Humans, for better or for worse, now control the planet. It's no longer tectonic forces or geology or biology or ecology, it's us. So the Oberlin Project, very quickly, um, it grew out of a conviction that we cannot stay isolated on our campuses, however good we are, and however, quote, sustainable we become as campuses. We don't move the needle much by being islands in a larger sea of unsustainability driven by intensive uh, use of fossil fuels. Uh, second, it won't be enough if we, however good we are, unless we catalyze a good bit beyond our campuses and begin to link up to a much wider network and a movement, call it, say, an ecological enlightenment, but it has to be global. As all of you know, the nature doesn't, doesn't make any difference what the source of the carbon emission is. It all mixes in the atmosphere. So we've now got to create and be part of and catalyze this global movement. As I've said, and as all of you know, time is short. It's not our friend. There are lots of people, many of you in this room, and Diane Dumanowski and I last night had a long conversation. There are lots of people uh, that would agree with Diane's assessment that time simply is not our friend. Many, many would believe that time is, is uh, already run out. And then this, uh, if we try to identify what kind of issue this is, Nicholas Stern in the Stern Review said this was the largest market failure in history. It is that. But prior to that, it's also the largest political failure in history. And so uh, carbon uh, was first uh, raised at the presidential level in a warning to Lyndon Johnson in 1965. We have yet to pass a de jure climate policy. We have a de facto <coughs> policy, which is still kind of pedal to the metal. Um, all of these ruminations got me uh, the book after writing the book uh, down to the wire. 
uh, a group of us uh, funded by the Lewis Foundation uh, put together what we call the, the President's Climate Action Plan. And this was aimed at the first 100 days of the next U.S. administration, be it Democrat or Republican, it didn't matter. Well, it mattered, but uh, the report would have been the same. And so looking at the first 100 days of the next administration, what do we do? You know, so we put together a document, uh, met with uh, all the presidential candidates except uh, Senator Thompson from Tennessee, who didn't think it was an issue. Uh, we met with uh, President-elect Obama, uh, met with his transition staff, and the rest is history. It didn't take. Uh, the health issue was put, put first, and we, we still we didn't respond politically to the, uh, to the issue. So for me, and this is a very personal story, for me, uh, I have four grandchildren. What do I do? What do we do? And so the Oblum Project, for me, at the personal level, is born out of a conviction of how do we begin to harness the efforts and the talent that we have, all of us have, uh, with young people and research capacity and buying power and investing power of an institution. All the questions that you wrestle with every day. So the Oblum Project is five things. Uh, number one, it's an effort by the college and the city in a joint partnership to rebuild the downtown economy. The college owns a 13-acre block right in the heart of Oberlin that features a, a great art museum, generally ranked number three behind those at Harvard and Yale. Uh, a great performing arts center, which needs to be rebuilt, and then a hotel, which needs to be uh, replaced. Uh, the goal is to begin to redevelop that area in a way that drives the local economy. Can we be a buyer of local woods and craft and foods and so forth? Can we do this at the Platinum Plus level for neighborhood development, and then plus another commitment to become an economic force in the community that otherwise would not happen. So break down the moat and do this in concert with the, with the city of Oberlin. Uh, the importance of this for us is that we're a city with a 28% poverty level, 53% uh, free and reduced lunch costs in the city schools. We're Rust Belt. And so we've got to help uh, other people in the Detroit, Toledo, Cleveland, Youngstown area understand how do we rejuvenate those economies. Our second goal is to be carbon neutral. Uh, we're one of the Clinton climate, uh, one of 14 Clinton climate, uh, uh, climate positive cities. We're at 10,000 or less. We're, one of the, we're the small kid on the block. The others are, you know, Beijing and other, other cities. Uh, we've been rolled into the C40 cities, but uh, we made a commitment along with a commitment with all of you to be carbon neutral as fast as possible. The city electric supply next year will be 96% carbon neutral. Uh, we believe we can move the college to carbon neutrality around the year 2025. We believe that's financially and technically possible. Now, we're a coal-fired region. Ohio, if you look at the ratio of uh, uh, carbon, coal-based carbon per dollar of GNP or gross state product output, we're about the highest in the nation. Our third goal, we believe that we can grow 70% of our food locally and restore a local agricultural economy. Now, this gets important because uh, you'll recall Stephen Hsu's speech in California in 2000, March of 2009, he said the era of California export agriculture is basically coming to a close. Higher fuel prices, uh, climate change will destroy that export agricultural base. We can't import the uh, food from California at a price we could afford, a volume that we need from California or any place else in this coming decades. You can put your own date on it. Ohio we used to be uh, a state that was agriculture with a quarter million farms. We're now down to about 65,000 farms, most of which grow corn and soybeans for the uh, protein market to exchange uh, to the Midwest. Our fourth goal, we're an educational institution. And as with the making of the Lewis Center, we see a huge educational opportunity. And all of you on your campuses have been busy trying to break down silos between disciplines. And that's a wonderful thing to do, a necessary thing to do. So young people emerge with a, a systems perspective. But we also, in this project, want to break down the silos between institutions. So we put together a consortium that includes a two-year college, a joint vocational school, both of which are extremely good institutions. And then the public schools and the college. So four institutions. And the question for us is how then do we uh, organize the educational experience, both intellectual and practical, for young people. So they emerge from this process as problem solvers, know how to roll up their sleeves and get real things done. Um, then our fifth goal. All this is just so much hot air and money expended unless we begin to replicate this. And so what all of you are doing to try to uh, stretch out this particular consortium of commitments to climate neutrality uh, and the work that we're doing is to begin to build a much wider network. 
uh, three years ago, we started a conversation with people uh, involved at the Pentagon in developing this as a national security project. And one of the interesting aspects was, for me, uh, this is one of those kind of forehead slapping moments. Uh, I did my PhD work in national security, but I hadn't seen this as a national security project. But it is. And it became very clear in going uh, talking with uh, Pentagon officials that there is a growing contingent in the U.S. security establishment that understands very clearly that security doesn't just start at shores and borders and move out. Uh, and the export of power, it also uh, includes everything that happens within those shores and borders. And so the organization of the electric grid and the food supply and the money supply, that is security as well. And broaden the definition of security uh, in much the way that uh, 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 Jessica Tucker Matthews uh, proposed in 1989 and begin to see that security is related to everything that you, you and I do. This is now a much bigger issue. So we're putting together a consortium of uh, institutions, including Army bases, uh, corporations, colleges and universities, and want all of you to be uh, participants with this. And I'll be in a conversation with Tony about this uh, later. Uh, and cities uh, and counties to begin to form a much larger network. And we took the idea to uh, Michael Mullen, who was at that time the, uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. His comment was, you've got to do this in every congressional district in the United States and you've got 10 years to do it. And that's a pretty good assessment. So that's our, uh, we take those as our marching orders. Uh, finally, let me just say this in conclusion. We're, uh, we face an issue, I, I don't think that we have fully assessed as a nation, I know that we've not fully assessed as a nation the severity and the seriousness of this. The climate effects that we now see, uh, we're setting climate and weather records at a record setting pace. Uh, and that's a result of what we did 30 years ago. That's what came out of our smokestacks and tailpipes 30 years ago. The climate has got a lot of lag effect. The lag effect is three decades now. It'll shrink to about 20 years with ocean acidification and ocean warming. That's one, one problem. The second is simply, as I mentioned, the longevity of the issue. This isn't solvable as you typically think of solving, let's say, a mechanical problem or a financial problem. This is a different order of problem. And then the destabilization, it isn't global warming. It's planetary destabilization. The theory that under which we operate is you can turn the thermostat up and nothing else wobbles over here. That's not the world in which we live. That's not climate change. The last thought is this. This uh, is labeled a leadership summit, and I applaud the leadership of everybody in the room. This has been a phenomenal success story. Is it nearly enough? No, this isn't enough. This will require a level of leadership, stamina, creativity, and quite frankly, courage that we have yet to summon. And so the, for me, the, the models are the, the courageous leadership of somebody to say like Abraham Lincoln on the issues of slavery and human dignity. That's the quality of leadership that we'll need to see. Um, <clears throat> I thank you for all of your work. Uh, we've drawn on it. Uh, you, we're all allies, that uh, sense of being a family. Uh, I applaud what you do. It's a real honor uh, to be here with you. Thank you. Okay, we have a few minutes for question and answer. So if uh, anybody would like to address your questions to either Marvin or David, we uh, would like that. You haven't had your coffee yet? <laughs> or enough coffee? No questions? Yeah. Uh, no, David, uh, David Marvin, fabulous uh, uh, example. So I guess my question uh, is, do you have any concerns about using security as a kind of organizing frame, given the sort of the dark sides of security that we've seen over the last uh, eight, ten years. I mean, I see the pragmatic side of it. It's, it's compelling, but there's a little side of me here that's struggling with that a bit. Is there an easier question? <laughs> uh, Tom, that, that's, that raises a good question. The short answer is yes. Uh, it is a little bit dancing with the devil. Uh, and, and I think that, uh, let me only say one thing, that with the vacuum of leadership on this issue, and if you're a lawyer about this, my uh, colleague Marvin Krizloff is, uh, it's said to be a crime if you yell fire in a crowded theater 
that's not Bernie. What's the name of the crime if you suppress the warning in a theater that in fact is Bernie? And so that's been the issue. We've, we've done a national walkabout on this issue. Remember back in American history in the 19, oh, late 60s and 1970s, all of the environmental legislation was passed by both Democrats and Republicans. NEPA uh, was uh, passed in 1969, EPA was created, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, uh, and so forth. And that was Democrats and Republicans coming together. And then something happened. Uh, we've done a 30-year walkabout. So in this vacuum, the military, in some ways, is standing up. Now, if you press me, I'll only say one other thing. Uh, it bothers me that we spend $1 trillion on military expenditures and war fighting. And we are number one. We spend more money on military expenditures than all the other countries combined, we're over half of the total expenditures on uh, weapons and war fighting. That's uh, not the way to sustainability. Your question begs finally that I think that we put that issue on the table, that issues of peace and justice, the justice was mentioned last night, peace ought to be there with it and there will be no peace and no sustainability and no fairness. Let's see reckon with all those. But Tom, thanks for the question. I appreciate that. Other questions? We, uh, we, we see what's going on or is not going on in Washington. And how effective do you think that some of this might happen at a state level where I think that there's a lot closer bond to us? And in some cases, I think state governments are more responsive and I have to say more responsible. Um, is there a way for this to happen as a a movement at the state level and just kind of ignore Washington because they obviously are ignoring us. You know, I think it really depends on the state and the budget. Um, I know that we were able to benefit from some stimulus money that came to Ohio and there were a series of grants to weatherize and, and try to engage in energy conservation. And a lot of us have very old campuses, and I think that's that's one of the things that needs to happen. My sense of the states is that many of them are struggling to meet basic needs of K-12, and that capital projects and some of these things might be possible, but it's pretty difficult given the times. Maybe not North Dakota, but, but most of the other states that I'm aware of anyway. One other uh, addition to that, and I, I should have said that the, the idea of this, the national network, can't stand alone on its, on its own. And so it's sooner or later, I mean, it's our version of a Tea Party movement. Uh, and all of us are kind of part of that, that effort, taking the anger and the angst that is clear in this country and redirecting that toward the kind of things that you're doing on your campuses and solarizing and rebuilding economies and rebuilding schools. The, the, the larger part, and, and the part of me that says there needs to be a national dialogue is this. There needs to be this top-down effort. We, we will need eventually climate legislation. We'll need global legislation of some sort, uh, simply to calibrate uh, carbon emissions and economy and so forth in a way that's fair and works for everybody around the world. So uh, in our effort to build a network, <clears throat> it's also partnered with a discussion uh, through the New America Foundation and other organizations. Uh, about grand strategy and larger national issues to calibrate what happens here at the bottom and grassroots on your campuses and your regions and states with this national dialogue. It's kind of what do we want to be as a nation when we finally grow up. Uh, but that's, um, in our state, one other thing, we're being targeted and I think corrupted by outside money. Uh, Citizens United has uh, led to something like $9 million so far being spent to unseat Sherrod Brown in the U.S. Senate. And so states are, are, are real corruptible. Thanks for the question. It's a really useful question. Uh, I'd just like to add one uh, piece uh, about that, about this, and that is that, you know, we've passed 37 environmental, major national environmental laws since uh, 1969. Not one of them was initiated by the federal government first. Every one of them was based on something, that, on a law or a program that was established at a state level first. Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes said that the states are the laboratories of democracy. And to a large extent, uh, when we get things that happen at the state level, then it, it 
uh, emerges into a national. And a perfect example in our area is that the automobile emission standards, it was California first and then the New England states joining, or the Northeast states joining, that forced the national automobile emission standards because when t once the market was big enough in California and the Northeast, then the auto industry said, you know, we got to have national legislation to make it happen. So the I think the, in a short answer to your question, Bill, is that it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. And uh, because there are things, and we'll be talking about this with the federal policy piece that will be part of our discussions today, where there, the federal government could take some actions that just gets out of the way and actually makes it, enables the, the ability for the, for, those, for the states and the colleges and universities to be able to actually have more alternatives and options to be able to move. But ultimately, uh, the, we have to have public policy that actually is creating the right incentives. And right now, the incentives are not right. And the incentives are all to continue to extract more fossil fuels, um, pass as much resources through the economy as possible, doesn't give incentives for a circular production economy. And so we, gotta, we have to fundamentally uh, shift that. And education is critical, and what we do at the local level is critical. But we'll need to make that, uh, if we do enough of this, then we will have, I think, the power to actually get good public policy. Not, poli not political, but good public policy that uh, is creating the right incentives. We'll take one more question. Uh, here. Here oh. I am. Well, there you are. <laughs> Rose, I'm sorry. That's OK. Uh, David, I was intrigued by the statement you made that in the next 10 years need to reach out to every congressional district. Could you clarify what would be done during that 10 years, and if that's taking place, how could the college campuses in each of those districts play a role? Well, Rose, thanks. Um, good question. The, the network that we're putting together will do what networks do, and, and what, uh, in this case, happens within this network as well. Amplify, uh, raise sites, coordinate, deepen commitments, help with funding and legal issues. It's so all the kind of the practical work that stitches things together to go from isolated projects to a, a national and hopefully eventually a global movement. The, the kind of partners and the coordination with, uh, uh, we've been offered uh, 17 Army bases as part of the network by the Under Secretary of the Army. How that would fit into the, the network, I really don't know. That, that's a, a coordination issue, but they've got their own uh, project. What we're trying to put together, as with uh, this organization, is to make a fierce commotion that is effective and right and agile and quick, <clears throat> and as much as we can make it adequate, <clears throat> excuse me, to the issues of the time. So we're, we're inventing something, uh, as all of you have invented here, that hasn't yet uh, quite been done. Uh, one last note, I see this very much as a collaborative venture uh, that would involve a network of organizations also and not just isolated uh, institutions. Uh, one last, last note. I, I think it's a, a bit of a reinvention of higher education. We've been, by and large, and this is not meant as a criticism of any organization here, any school, college, university. Uh, we've been, by and large, inward-looking organizations. And I think if the Oberlin Project has any distinction, it is to be part of now a network that is reaching out beyond. We're not uh, clearly not the first. I went to the University of Pennsylvania for graduate work. Judith Roden in the 1990s uh, did a fabulous uh, piece of work with West Philly in taking uh, university money and leveraging the redevelopment of 40-acre blocks. So this is obviously not the first. There are precedents. But it means that we can't look just inward. And I think for faculty, one final, final note, uh, this will end. <laughs> Tony, <okay>. uh, <coughs> th this will, uh, one, one final note, and this I think is the tougher thing. <clears throat> Green campuses are a means, not an end. And by the time we put up all the <clears throat> solar collectors and windmills and do all the efficiency stuff, the, the, that, that is the means toward changing how young people and faculties and whole college and whole college community think. The real shift here is a mind shift. It is not a technical shift. It's, it's entirely possible to have brown education on a green campus. And so the goal here is really a mental shift, to begin to think, change how we think and, and uh, begin to see opportunities in our own situations. So uh, thanks for the question. It, it's a process of invention, but thank you for that. 
It's, it's got to be quick because uh, I'm getting a signal from Tony who does a marvelous job of keeping us on track. So, <coughs> When the people who uh, are currently opposing climate legislation finally figure out what's uh, going on, uh, they'll turn to geoengineering. Uh, what do you say uh, when people suggest uh, that that's part of the answer? Uh, <laughs> uh, I think geoengineering, like a lot of ideas, is one that hasn't improved with, with age. Uh, and if, uh, assuming that the time, and I'm, I hope uh, the day of reckoning uh, or intellectual enlightenment does occur with, with these people. I'm not certain when or how that will happen. Uh, <clears throat> but the, the problem with geoengineering is we don't know what it will do. Uh, we don't, we're not ready yet to adjudicate the problems that it would create. It would increase, for example, rainfall in some parts of the world, decrease it elsewhere. Uh, uh, depending on the, the nature of the, uh, the way geoengineering would occur, if, if it's to put particles or kind of a, what's been called an umbrella over the top of the earth and block incoming solar radiation, then it has one effect, uh, but we don't really know what those effects are going to be at a cost that is probably astronomical and unaffordable. These are all things we simply don't know. Uh, it asks us to play God uh, with a planet in a way that would be unprecedented and probably irrevocable. We couldn't, we couldn't recover from it. Now, if we were a purely rational species, we're, we're not so much a rational species, as all of you know, uh, as we are a very adept at rationalizing. If we were a rational species, we would do what the uh, global, McKinsey Global has said all along, and Amory Levins and lots of people, and, and many of you in this room, you'd push energy efficiency as fast and as hard as we could possibly do it. Uh, I've got a shelf full of studies. The average is you could eliminate half of the energy use uh, at no net cost over a period of three decades. Half at no net cost. Fast, cheap, doesn't uh, run any kind of other risks. And creates jobs in the U.S. And creates jobs. And, and the same with deployment of solar. I mean, we already have solutions. Yeah. Th this is a problem uh, you know, looking for a solution, looking for a problem to solve. But thanks for the question. I think that that's a, it's also a really good question uh, for curriculum. If you're looking for curriculum issues, uh, climate change is resonant with all kind of curricular issues. And I would start not with economics uh, and not with politics. I'd start with morality first. Uh, Stephen Gardner's book, by the way, on climate change is uh, right now the best thing going in that level. But th this raises all kind of other issues, which are fundamental, they're curricular, and they're also interesting issues. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we're ready to move on to the next level of the program. But before we do that, uh, I, we have a, a special Visionary Leadership Award for David Orr, and I don't think we have to say much more about what he's done. You've heard, you hear the ideas. Um, the, the, David is one of these people who, who can generate so many ideas and connect the dots in so many different ways that it is very unusual um, for, for most people in society. And he's been a great friend of mine, a great mentor. Uh, he was a member of the Second Nature Board of Directors. Uh, and it was his idea in 2000, in an article that he wrote for the Chronicle for Higher Education, that campuses ought to, ought to be climate neutral and that we ought to try to do it by 2020. And, uh, and he planted that seed and of course some of his uh, friends uh, picked up on it and decided that maybe uh, we ought to try to make happen what he was trying to, what, what he was saying. And so um, the David, a uh, longtime friend, mentor, uh, colleague and uh, someone who is a uh, kindred soul uh, for, for me. Um, we uh, would like to present you, David, with this Visionary Leadership Award as a pioneer uh, in uh, education and in leadership for a sustainable society. David? Thanks, and, and thanks to all of you. Uh, my 10-year-old uh, granddaughter asked where I was going yesterday, and I said, well, I'm going to Washington. She says, well, why? She keeps track of my travel schedule. <laughs> I said, uh, well, I'm going to get uh, an award of some sort. And uh, 
She said, are you sure you deserve it? <laughs> she blew her Christmas present for this year. Uh, I'm not sure I do. Uh, but let me say, this, I, I accept this on behalf of the college, an extraordinary college with extraordinary leadership, a place where uh, I've been for 22 years. I accept it on behalf of Tony and all of you because this has been a collective movement. This, this isn't me. Uh, this, we stand on the uh, uh, shoulders of giants, as it was once said. It's your creativity. It, it's the creativity now that is, is moving this planet in a very different direction. So I thank all of you. I thank you for your work and applaud your work. And Tony, thanks again for this award. This is, this is great. Okay, I'm going to turn the uh, podium over to uh, Mitch Tomashow, who is the director of our um, is the director of our Presidential Fellows Program, former president of uh, Unity College, former member of the Steering Committee of the President's Climate Commitment. And uh, before I do that, I, I want to add something to what uh, David Hale said last night. Um, and he uh, mentioned that Second Nature is looking for a new president. Uh, I just want you to know that I'm not retiring to go and and sit and contemplate my navel or other things like that. I'm going to continue to work with Second Nature if the new president and the board continues to want me to do, do so and work on the development of a, a leadership institute with Mitch and others. And so I'm not going away. I just, uh, because a lot, number of people said, well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Uh, and the answer is I don't really know, but I'm not going away. Um, the, this is a passion of mine for life, and I just wanted to mention that to, to all of you.